usually quite tangled. Uh, this has been processed a bit in that it's been, uh, it has been washed, so it doesn't smell <laughs> quite as bad, but it still has quite a strong kind of lamellin smell, the grease that was. Do you want to pass it around and experience that? <laughs> <laughs> lamellin is an old factory, so. Right, you're very used to the way lamellin is. And did you have lovely hands? Did it make your hands lovely? Yeah, it did. It was very depends on the small we were doing. Hmm. Because people now use extracts of lamellin in hand creams and so on. Um, it's the natural waterproofing that goes through the wool. Um, so in modern textiles, usually they wash as much of it out of it as they don't want to feel greasy. In the past, it was a really valuable thing in the wool that gave you waterproof clothing. Um, so that's fine, you don't want to wash the, the lanolin out of the wool, but you do want to wash out the muck and you know, the grass twigs around it. Um, we've been breeding sheep to produce lovely wool for an awfully long time and what we'd like is long fibres, you see how long they are. Wool also grips itself very nicely, that's what makes threads on this spinet. What we want to do is get it so that all these fibres are um, facing the same direction or easier to spin because at the moment they're all in the the different kinds of artifacts we find in relation to those, um, these are combs. You get them in all sorts of places, um, all around Europe, really. These ones are made out of bone. We imagine that sometimes you get them made out of wood as well, but wood doesn't survive so well for us. Um, see, sometimes they have very short teeth, sometimes they have very long teeth, and these are basically always just called weaving combs. Um, you can use combs like that with the teeth to make the, to, to bash the fibers in the direction you want to when you're weaving. But I wonder whether they might actually be more to do with oral combing production. I wonder whether the way that they get polished, they might be used to comb the fibers out like this. Because um, you might be able to see, this is an example that was excavated from Clackatold Rock on the west coast, just this summer. You can see it's still all the dirt from here, it's on it. It's got a very handy hole that's been drilled through it to help you keep it nearby. Quite a few of them have those. And you might just be able to see on the teeth that there's kind of circular grooves on them. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Just over here. Now no one's really been able to explain those but you do get them quite frequently on a lot of these artifacts. Can we ask, are the circles round the <laughs> pieces? <laughs> They're around each individual tree. Yeah. And it, sometimes it's all the way around. Um, which doesn't make sense for weaving on a loom. Because when you're weaving on a loom, the wear should only be the thread in between the teeth and the thread underneath the teeth. So you get linear wear on two varieties. But here, it's circular all the way around. And that makes me wonder whether it's more to do with this combing, where as you're trying to get the knots out, the fibres are wrapping themselves around and pulling against the comb. So there's some experimental archaeology to be done there, which some of you guys can have a go at. <laughs> Just get combing away. Now, these are the only artifacts we have that might that might be to do with this fibre preparation from a prehistoric period. Um, in the medieval period, we have a different method, which we know about. Um, oops, there we go. It's carding. And that's what these are, carders. We know that they're using these because occasionally we find bits of the wire and stuff, but also they very handily drew pictures of them doing it. We <coughs> like the medieval period. They draw a lot of pictures in their uh, medieval manuscripts. Um, so we've got uh, a gentleman here who is helping a lady who is spinning on the great wheel and he is carving the wool. And at the bottom here we have a lady who's carving wool um, while someone is gesticulating at her. Um, you can see that they're both doing a very similar action. What they're doing is something like this. And that's because the hooks are all bent downwards. So when I do this, it grips on both sets of both sets of cards. And then I can do a little bit of 
magic, which is transfer all the roll from one card to another, like this, by brushing away and taking it off. And then when you're happy with it, you make a roller where you just fold it off like this, and you've got a kind of little nice piece of cloud. Mm. <laughs> and this in this creates quite a different bit of wool to spin. When you comb, you're getting all the fibres in the same direction, and you're spinning from them that way. When you card, you're getting all the fibres to go round and round and round. And then when you spin that, it makes a much fluffier kind of um, thread. But it grips itself very well because the fibres when fibres are all aligned, they're going in one long twist. So it makes quite a different thread, and that's not really something that people experiment with either. So then once you've, once you've prepared your fibre, you need to spin it. Um, we have loads of evidence of the way that people spun things in the form of spindle worlds. Now, these can be made of stone, bone, wood, clay. Um, quite often you see them made out of broken bits of pot. Um, particularly Roman, um, they have what had been part of their jar, they've broken a shard off of it, they turned it into a circle and they drilled a hole in it and they must know they've got themselves uh, spindle well. They can come in all sorts of um, sizes, you get really wide ones, you get really narrow ones, you get ones that are very deep and you get ones that are very wide and flat. They do spin in, a, in quite different ways. Um, so, when, if you spin, if you pirouette, when you put your arms around, you've got more, more momentum to keep you spinning. But an ice skater, when they spin around, they start the momentum and then they pull their arms in to make them go faster. So the wider you have, the more momentum you have to keep going around. But the more weight that it is, the faster you go. And the same is true of spindle, heavy spindle. Will be, it will be much easier to produce a thick thread because as you're spinning, a thick thread requires a lot of energy, a lot of momentum to keep spinning. So a heavy, wide spindle uh, world will be much better for creating a thick thread. On the other hand, it won't support a very thin thread. So a small um, spindle will be better for that. And the thicker it is, the faster you can spin. <laughs> so rather than having to um, keep on keeping the metal density, you know, spin. This is a very basic technology. People do it all around the world. Uh, people continue to spin like this right through into the modern era because spinning wheels are expensive. Uh, you have to sit at them when you're using them. Whereas spindles, you can use anywhere. You can wander around the farm while you're doing it. Um, you can just pick it up and put it down. You see, that's basically how it works. And then twirl it on to the, the world. And then you spin. Eventually, you run out of space on that, and you have to take it off and start again. When I twist them all forward, the, the threads twist around each other as they go. And what you're referring to is, as they, the twist moves along, and the, the threads will grip each other, they get tangled up, and eventually, when there's so, so much twist on their side that you can't get any more weaving in. But if you twist forward and back, 